So it's quite troubling times in the world at this point in time. And a lot of us are looking for ways in which we can streamline what we're doing, save some money, but still be able to give the great quality service. So in this video, I'm going to give you 20 online resources that are going to help you do just that. Best of all, every single one of these is free or the free option gives you more than enough to do what most of us will need to do. So first of all, let's kick this off with some great resources for stock images that are completely free that you can use for personal and commercial projects. So whether you're building a website for yourself, for a client, or just for some fun, you're going to need stock images at some point. And this is where some of these free stock image libraries are a real lifesaver. If you go back a couple of years ago, the quality of the images that were on these free libraries were pretty poor. However, that's changed drastically. So we've got a couple that I want to show you in today's video. The first one is Libra Stock Photos. What this does is this will search through a range of different other sites for you to find stock images. So for example, let's just say we wanted to search for cakes. You can see this will now go through. We've got some sponsored images at the top. We can ignore those. But you can see when we scroll down, you can see it tells us the image itself and where we're going to download it from. So stocksnap.io from negative space. A range of different sites. This is a nice, quick and easy way of searching multiple sites just from one simple interface. Another one that I like is stocksnap.io. Again, it does the same kind of thing, only this is only going to look through its own dedicated library. So again, let's just take a look for cakes. And once we search through there, you can see we get a range of really nice looking images. Now, the first ones are sponsored images from Shutterstock, so bear that in mind. If you see this little sort of green section in the top left-hand corner, it's a sponsored image. But everything after that are all stock-free or royalty-free CC licensed images. Next, we've got the option for Unsplash. And again, Unsplash gives us a ton of options, lots of different categories, lots of different types of images to find. So let's just say laptops for this one. And again, we can go through and we can fine tune exactly what we want, find some really nice looking images. There's collections inside here, so collections of different types of images all grouped together. If we wanted to with this, we can subfilter this down. So we could say we wanted only laptops or computers or electronics, PC screen, computer keyboards, all those kinds of good things. Final one I want to look at is Pexels. And again, this is another good one because we can find lots of really good looking images. Now, one of the things I really like about this is if you use a tool like any of the Affinity software, that's automatically linked into some of these different websites. So let me just open up Affinity Photo a second. I've got a blank document open. And on the right hand side, we've got stock as a new tab. If you don't have that, you can find that through the window section. Just open that up. And in there, we can search Pixabay and Splash and Pexels. So we can easily come in, search for something that we want. When we find an image from any of those stock images, we can simply drag that over, drop it on our page. It'll tell us where that's come from. It tells us there's the photo, who it's from, where it's come from, and the dimensions of it. Now this integrates with any of the Affinity tools. So if you're creating publications using Affinity Publisher, you can just drag in images from any of the stock libraries. The same goes for Affinity Photo and Affinity Designer. So we've got a lot of options and these are just some of the really cool free stock image libraries out there at this point in time. I think we all agree that when it comes to photo manipulation, image editing, Photoshop is probably the most well-known software out there. However, not all of us have the ability to be able to purchase that or we may be cutting back and that's one of those things that just has to go for now. Well, in this section, I'm going to show you a range of free alternatives that are going to take you from some of the basic things you can do right the way up to being, well, almost in line with a lot of what Photoshop can do. And again, they have amazing free options and most of these, the free options are more than enough for most of us. So let's take a look at those Photoshop alternatives that are all free online inside your browser. So when it comes to online photo editors, we've got a lot of different options to play with. Some more feature packed than others, and it depends on the kind of thing that you want to do. If all you want to do is a simple resize and then save it out, there are some great tools. However, if you want to get in and do a lot more editing and then output that information, you can do that too. So today I'm going to take you through four different options, but like I say, there are more available to you. So first up, we're going to take a look at Pixlr. Now we're going to use the advanced pixeler. So we're going to click to open that up. And the first thing you're going to see is this nice, simple, clean interface that allows us to do one of three different things. We can pull up our history. We can create a new or open an image, 
or we can do a stock search. So we can search stock libraries and pull in images from there. So let's do that. Do a stock search. You can see we've got flower. We're going to say mountains. And what we'll do is we'll just hit enter. And you can see now it's going to search through a range of different online free stock image libraries. So you can see we've got a ton of really great looking images which we can pull from. So let's just say we'll open this particular image up. That'll download it. We can choose what format we want to resize if we want to resize at all. However, we're going to just say we'll go to the Ultra HD just to make sure we've got a nice image that we can just do whatever we want to with good quality. Hit apply. That pulls this in. Now, if you ever used anything like Photoshop, or Affinity Photo, a lot of this is going to be very familiar to you. And the fact that this is all online and completely free to use is just insane. So even if you don't have any money available to you, but you still want to do some image editing to use with your web design, you have tools like this available. Okay, so down the left-hand side, you can see we've got our tool palette. So we can crop, we can do selections, we can do magic wand selections, we can apply text over the top, whatever we want. On the right hand side, we've got layers in exactly the same way as Photoshop and Affinity Photo, your history so you can go through and see exactly what you've done in the past. We can zoom into the image and as you can see, even though this is pretty much all being done online, it's not slow at all. Keyboard shortcuts that you're used to from things like Photoshop, so holding the space bar down to just be able to pan around the image, all available to you. We can zoom in and out with the mouse wheel. We can make edits to this. We can do whatever we want. We've even got a range of different options at the top. So you can auto adjust this if we want to. We can come in and we can apply filters to it. So if we wanted to apply Gaussian blur, for example, apply a vignette around this. We can do all of that, all online. Apply that. Super simple. So that's the first one, which is Pixel Up. And probably my most highly rated one if you want to get into a little bit more feature packed kind of online editor. And next up we have photo and this is a very similar kind of thing we can edit a photo we can make a collage of multiple images or we can create a design so what we're going to do is say edit a photo so we're going to click to open that option up and you can see let's get rid of these we've got some simple ways we can drag and drop an image in if we want to or we can choose one of the sample images just for simplicity i'm going to choose one of the sample images that will open that up and now we have a selection of free things that we can do. Now, some of the things inside here are only available if you upgrade to the paid version. However, there should be more than enough. And even if all you want to do is resize and crop and then output, you could use this perfectly fine. So you see we've got crop. We can easily come in and crop this to free form or we can choose a square golden ratio, whatever we kind of want to do to make sure it's being cropped to the right scale. We can rotate this if we want to. We've got basic options inside here, so brightness, contrast, saturation, and so on. We can also come in and we can use some of the predefined effects. Now you'll see that anything that's got this little gold sort of tab on there, that's telling you these are something you'd have to pay for, so we don't have access to those. However, like I say, there's enough options inside here to keep most of us quite happy. So if we want to do a retro kind of look, we could use a sepia effect on there and it's immediately applied. Very simple, really straightforward to work with. Once we've done that, if we want to, we could save this or we can output it. We can do whatever we want. So let's click on save. It comes in and allows us to give it a name, choose between JPEG and PNG, gives us a quality option and also tells us the estimated file size depending upon the file format that we use. So again, a super simple set of tools, but we've got all those basic options we need inside here for absolutely no money whatsoever. So the third option is Polar, which is another online photo editor. Again, we've got the same options. We can open a photo or open a sample. On the left and right hand sides, we have a selection of different tools and options we can use. So let's just open a sample image. So we'll let that download. There we go. You can see now on the left hand side, we've got filters, we've got text and shapes, we've got the ability to retouch the image, we can crop, and we can also take a look at any overlays. On the right hand side, we've got adjustments. So you can see if we open up this, we've got a ton of different things we can do with adjustments. We've also then got selective adjustments. So if you want to just make a change to just a single part of the image, maybe highlight a face or something like that, we could do that inside here. We also have the editing history, so we can see all the different things we've done, including keyboard shortcuts. And finally, we've got undo. At the bottom, we've got the option to show the original. On the left-hand side, you can see you've got these options, and we can take a look at copy and edits, auto enhance, and all those kinds of things, including tutorials and keyboard shortcuts. So if you want to take a look at getting more out of this, this is a good place to start. 
then at the top we can easily come in and save this photograph. So let's take a quick look. Let's just choose one of these adjustments. So let's say we're going to create add a vignette in there. We can simply adjust that. And what I like about this is it gives you a visual representation of what you're going to do. If you take it to the left hand side, it's going to darken the edges. You take it to the right hand side, it's going to lighten the edges. So it's a nice, simple, intuitive interface. We've also got the histogram in the top left hand side so we can see exactly what we're doing on there to make sure that we don't blow things out or underexpose things to the point of being just completely losing detail. So that's pretty cool. We can come to things like colors and we can adjust the temperature so we can make this cooler if we wanted to or warm it up. All again visually editing this directly inside this simple online editor. So really simple and once we're ready to save this we can say save the photo. This option gives us more than we saw inside photo so we can just save the image in a range of different formats, the quality, the name, we can resize, fit, crop, and choose any presets inside here. We can apply a watermark if we want to. We can tell it whether we want to preserve any of the metadata. And if we wanted to, if you wanted to upgrade, you could use the batch processing option. So again, a really super simple kind of thing, but tons of options. And the fact again that it's free is just great. And the fourth and final option in our list is called Photo P. This is very much modeled after an application like Photoshop, very similar to what you could do in Pixlr E. However, this is a little bit more sort of feature packed and a little bit more traditional in its kind of layout and style. So you can see we've got all the options to file and open. We can take a picture, we can publish online, we can do lots of different things. So let's open an image. So let's just find something. We'll choose this one of myself. And you can see now once you've got that open, we've got all the options you'd expect from an application like Photoshop. So layers, channels if you want to make changes, we've even got paths inside you. So this is very much like Photoshop in an online version. If you want to, you can, with all of these, upgrade to a full account so you can get a lot more options available to you. But hopefully what this will demonstrate is that there are great options and alternatives to tools like Photoshop and Affinity Photo out there that cost zero money and give you a ton of options. So if you wanted to do some quick and easy edits without installing extra software all inside your browser, there's four great options that you can choose from. So we've done all the image corrections you want to do in those fantastic online Photoshop alternatives. You saved your file out. The next thing you could probably want to do is compress those images to get them as small as possible while retaining great quality. So in this one, I'm going to show you three different alternatives that you can do just that. Start compressing your images ready to go onto your website. So first up on our image compression, we've got short pixel. Now you do have the option to pay for this and then you can link it through to your WordPress website and it gives you a ton of really cool options. However, you don't need to use it in that way. If you just want to simply upload some images, compress them on the fly and then download, you can use this and you can use it for quite a lot of different images. So all we have is the option to simply come in and compress. We can ignore pretty much everything else on here. So we're gonna come into compress now, there are some limitations if you choose to just go with the free option on here. You can't batch download. You can upload multiple files and you can download those one at a time. However, if you have an account, you can download those as a zip. So it just speeds up the whole process. But like I say, that's probably one of the only real limitations you have to just use this as a quick and dirty way of optimizing images. So what do we have? We have three different options. We have lossy, glossy and lossless. Lossy is going to give us the biggest file compression, so therefore you could potentially see more artifacts because more compression is applied. Glossy is kind of like that middle ground. It's going to give you some compression, but quality is going to be more important than smaller file sizes. And then finally, lossless is going to put the minimum amount of compression on there while losing pretty much no noticeable or visible detail. So choosing the right option for you is a key in this point. So Work process would be, I'd use an online image editor to scale to what I need, crop it, whatever you want to do. Then you could output it from there and then use something like short pixel to compress it to get the smallest file size. So with that being said, let's just take a look at how this works. I'm gonna upload an image, which is about three and a half megabytes. So I'm gonna upload that. We'll leave it set to lossy for now. And once that goes through, it'll now go through the compression routine and then it'll allow us to take a look at that before we go to the time and effort of actually downloading anything. So the file all completed and uploaded, you can see it tells us, it gives us using lossy about 72% file saving. So the original file, which was pretty big, probably about 3,500 pixels wide. So it's a, it's a pretty big image, bigger than you'd want to use online. 
it started off at four megabytes and it's going to come down at about 1.1. If we click on this little eye icon, we can take a look and compare the image before and after. So we get the original on the left hand side and then the short pixel compressed version on the right hand side. And even though this is lossy, there's probably hardly any noticeable difference at this kind of size. However, if you open this up one to one, you probably would see some more compression inside there. What we can do now if we want to is we could choose glossy and we could re-upload that image. We'll let that go through exactly the same process and we'll see by using glossy, we're going to have less compression applied to it, which means we're going to end up with a slightly bigger file size. And there we go. Using the glossy option, we save about 66%. So not a massive difference in the file size saving. It's only about 300 kilobytes or 300K. And as you can see, again, it's gone from four megabytes to 1.4. So once you've gone through and you've compressed everything, all you need to do is hit the download button. It'll download to your computer and then you can use it as you see fit. So that's the first option. Next up, we have two other websites, which are basically the same website. They do exactly the same thing. You've got tiny PNG and you've got tiny JPEG. All it really means is they're branded slightly differently with different domains, but they are doing exactly the same thing. Doesn't matter which one you choose, you can upload both PNG and JPEG files. So all you need to do is simply drag and drop the file that you want. So I'll use a PNG this time. We'll drop that up there and you can see it tells us there's the starting file size, 6.1 kilobytes. Once it's compressed it, it's 2.8 kilobytes. So we've saved 54% on that file size, retaining all of the benefits of using PNG files. So we've got that transparency, everything is set up. So great for logos, great for things where you want to keep drop shadows and so on. This is a super little online site that I use tons and tons and tons to do this exact kind of thing. If you are a Photoshop user, you can, if you want to, take a look at the Photoshop plugin they've got. It's a one-time purchase, and then you can basically do this directly inside Photoshop without the need for an internet connection or to use the tiny PNG or tiny JPEG site. But both super simple sites, all three of those together give you great options to compress your images before you upload them to your website. So next up, we have color palettes. What am I talking about? Well, let's just say you're looking for a great color combination for your client's website, but you don't really have a good starting point, or they've really only got one color they want to use, and you're looking for those complementary colors, shades, tones, anything whatsoever. These are gonna make that whole process way easier. As a bonus, one of these online resources also makes it incredibly easy to make sure that your colors are gonna work perfectly for anybody that may have color blindness as an issue. And if your website needs to make sure that you cater for that market, this is gonna have you covered. So let's just take a look now with these color combination option websites. So first up, we have the big daddy of all these kind of online color tools, and that's Adobe Color. If you've never used Adobe Color before, it's a very simple but can look quite complex way of choosing color schemes that are complementary to each other. So if you are color challenged, these are great resources to make sure that your site just looks great color wise. So what do we have? We have a range of different options to choose from. We start off, we've got these five different color chips. So what you can do is you can easily come in, find your base color, which is gonna be your initial starting point color, and then Adobe Color will look for complementary colors using different kinds of methodology for graphic design color schemes. So what do I mean by that? Let's just take a look. You've got your color wheel in between and we can drag any of these points and we'll adjust, but all those colors are basing themselves on complementary colors. We pull it out to the outside, they get more colorful. We take it to the inside, they get closer to that sort of grayscale color. So each one of these circles represents one of the colors in this color palette underneath. And then underneath that, we've got the color values in hexadecimal values, and we've got the red, green, and blue, and the brightness channels at which we can adjust. If you want to, you can swap that over to other color modes, so CMYK if you're working for print, HSV, or lab color. Generally, you're gonna be using either RGB or CMYK for most purposes, because RGB is gonna be what you use for your screen representation, and CMYK is more to do with the print side of things. So once you've kind of got that base color you want, you can then choose on the left-hand side the types of color relationships that you want to work with. So at the moment, we're looking at analogous. We can, if you wanted to, switch over to monochromatic. And like I say, you can see this little white pyramid. This is dictating what the base color is, the color that's being used to work with all these other different kinds of color harmony rules. So if we use triad, 
you can see this now uses a triad of color representations based upon that initial center color. So we can easily use complementary, split complementary, double split complementary. Don't worry too much about the terms. It's more a case of just going through until you find out what you like. And once you like it, you can save it. If you're a Adobe user or if you just have Photoshop, you can set this up inside your account. So you can log into Adobe Color and then you can save these color palettes straight over and then share those throughout all of the Adobe tools that you use. So if you are an Adobe Creative Cloud user, this is a great way of finding those color schemes and then linking those through so you can use those on every single application for complete color continuity across everything you're doing. It's the way I use it and it's a real time saver when you're just making sure your colors are bang on. Now another online color generator that I came across recently that I think is absolutely fantastic and it's just a load of fun is coolers.co. It does a very similar kind of thing to what you've got with Adobe Color, but it's doing it in a slightly different way. And there's some really nice things inside here. So what we're going to do is we're going to start the generator and that'll take us in. If you've never used this before, it will go through and take you through a sort of step by step wizard. But what we've effectively got are the same kind of five colors. We can press the space bar on the keyboard and it will just randomly generate colors for us. And then we can take a look at the color palettes from there. So you could, if you wanted to, try to stumble across something that you think is quite nice. But let's just say you've gone through a couple of color iterations. You think, I quite like the look of this, but I want to try something else. But I really like the look of one or two of these colors. You can lock them down. So we can easily click on this one. We lock it. So this is now locked and the other four colors are completely free to be adjusted. If I press the space bar again, it's now going to look for complementary colors that work alongside this initial color that we've set up, that we've locked down. We've got the hexadecimal values underneath it. We can, if we want to, we can look at alternative shades for this color alone. So if I click on that, you can see we can see all the shade values inside there, which if you are working on a monotone color palette on your website, this is superb where you want to sort of get shades or gradients or whatever you want to work with that are X number of shades away from each other. So you may want to have four shades apart and then you might want to have five boxes that are extolling the virtues of a particular product, whatever you kind of want to do with your site. And this is just a super way of being able to do just that. So I really like that. You can also drag so we can reposition this inside the order of these different colors that we want. We can also come in and adjust this. So again, you can see we've got the HSB, we've got RGB, CMYK, and so on values. We can adjust these based upon whichever value we choose. So HSB is your hue, saturation, and brightness. So if we like the look of this, we want to make it a little darker. We can easily adjust that. We can go to RGB, and you can see we can adjust the red, green, and blue values. The CMYK will give us the cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So we've got a great range of different ways in which we can fine tune and adjust these colors. We're not stuck there, man. We've got more options across the top. We can, if we want to, we can pick colors from an image so we could easily upload a photograph and then pick colors from that photograph and use those as the basis for our color palette. We've also got color blindness. So if you are working for a website where color blindness may be an issue because you want to make sure that the colors work well for everybody, you can click and you can see a range of different color blindness definitions, different types of color blindness. And then what you can do is you can come down and you can click and you can see a visual representation of what someone with that color blindness condition, how they would see the colors that you're choosing. So again, it's one of those things that you could use this. And as long as those colors all work, there's good separation between all the values. So you don't cause any visual sort of confusion. Then you may have a great color part to work with. So go back up. Next up, we've got toggle alternative shades. So like we did with the one color, we can do this globally across all of the different colors we've got as part of our color palette. So a super simple way of being able to find and fine tune the different values you want. And then finally, we've got the adjust palette. So we can click on there and we can now globally adjust the hue, the saturation, the brightness and the temperature. And when we're ready, we can export this. And if we had an account we paid for, we logged in and set up, we can also save these values. But for a free account, Super simple, tons of options, and should help you get fantastic color palettes for your website. So we've covered those great color combinations. We've taken a look at cropping, correcting, and refining images. We've also looked at how we can compress them to make sure that they are optimized for websites. The next thing we're going to take a look at that's going to help with your design process is all about fonts. So 
If you are looking for font inspiration, looking for great combinations, then these websites are going to be perfect for you. But join me as I take you through and show you a couple of other little tools that are not online resources, but they're going to make the whole process of working with fonts on your system or finding out what font combinations have been used on websites you like much, much easier. So let's take a look at those tools right now. So first up, we've got Font Pay, and I'm kind of covered this website before because I think it's a great starting point for many new designers who don't really understand how font pairings really work and how to get the best out of making sure that everything just looks good on your site. We've got font pair like I say so this will give you the ability to take a look at some of the featured font pairs you can take a look at different types of font pairings so you've got sans serif and serif in other words you've got sans serif which means it doesn't have all those little curly bits at the end of the letters and serifs that they do so you can see if you look at Laura and Merriweather they're both serif fonts because they've got those nice little curls at the end of each of the letters so you can easily come over and just choose different font pairings and then you can see which ones work really well together once you've seen that and you think, actually, I really like that, you can download that font pair and that'll download this directly onto your computer as a zip file. However, if you're using this for a web design project, then what you can do is you can come over to Google Fonts. And once we're inside Google Fonts, you could search for those fonts and then you could just use those inside your designs. So Google Fonts is a fantastic resource for anybody using fonts for not only online purposes. So if you're using something like Elementor or using WordPress or something or anything to build your web design, most of the different designers out there have full access to working with the Google Fonts families. So you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different fonts to choose from. So having bland, boring designs that look the same as the next website should be something you can banish to the past with great combinations of good looking fonts. Now, let's just say you found some fonts you're using them on your website and you then want to go ahead and use some of these fonts then inside some printed material or you may want to create downloadable PDFs and so on and you want to use those same fonts. You could download these to your computer but you can very quickly get a massive amount of fonts on your system and it can just slow your system down completely. So what I would recommend and this isn't technically a website but it's something I thought was very useful to put into this section anyway is a semi-free piece of software called font base now font base is a little application you download install on your computer once you've done that you can then create locations on your computer that you can store different fonts you want to work with or if you want to work directly with google fonts you can simply click on the google font section and then you can go through search for the fonts you want activate them and you have that font on your system ready to work with. And then when you finish with it, you can deactivate it and it's no longer part of your font library. You can just activate and reactivate as and when you need. So if you are the kind of person that wants to work with multiple different fonts, give yourself a bit of a break and get yourself something like font base and use that then to just keep managing your fonts. Just super simple, super easy. And you can get away with the free account for most purposes. Finally, we've got another little tool that I've kind of covered in other things, and that's an extension for your Chrome-based browser, which is called What Font. So if you were looking at websites and you think you really like the look of a font, and you think, I don't know what font that is, well, What Font is great for you. All you need to do is activate it. Once it's activated, you can simply then just come over and click on any font that you want to take a look at. So let me quickly show you this in action. I'm just gonna activate it from my Chrome browser. You can see it says what font. All we need to do now is come over any font that we can see on the page and you can see it'll tell us exactly what that font is. If you want to find out more about it, all we need to do is click and it now tells us not only the name of the font, but the weight of the font, the font family, the style, the size, the line height, the color, all those kinds of really cool things. So you can easily find out exactly what is being used on any site and then you can take a look at getting that font yourself and using that font pairing, that font style on a site that you may be designing. So it's just a great way to find out that extra information all directly inside your Chrome-based browser. Super simple and one of those tools that I absolutely love and probably use almost every single day. Okay, so we've covered a ton of design oriented tools. Now we're gonna take a look at some more heavy hitters. If you're looking for something that gives you the ability to work with custom post types, advanced custom fields, creating all those kinds of things, but you don't want to rely upon plugins, these websites may be the answer, especially if you're not that comfortable going in and hand coding all those things you need to do, could make mistakes, could just not really know what you're doing. 
these little websites are going to be a godsend for you to make that whole process way easier. So let's take a look at what they offer us right now. So the first of our tools that enhances what you want to do with things like advanced custom fields and custom post types and so on is going to be generate WP. There are some pro features inside here, but there's also a ton of absolutely free options, most of which are the kind of thing that you may want to use yourself. So let's just scroll down the page and you can see we've got tools and generators. They're all broken down into various different types of tools. So some things to do with the admins, so like a toolbar generator and dashboard widget generator. As you can see, any premium feature is marked with premium, so you'd have to pay to get access to that. However, like I say, there's a ton of options that are completely free. So we come into content, for example, we can see we've got post type generator, taxonomy generator. So let's just open up the post type generator. That'll take us over then into the relevant section. From there, we can just come in and we can do a ton of different things. Now, this isn't a dedicated tutorial on how to use this. If you'd like to see more on how you could implement something like this, let me know and I'll take a look at putting some content together for you. But let's just take a basic look at what we're doing. You can see we've got different tabs across the top, so general, post type, labels, and so on. So all the different key parts that make up a custom post type. So you can see function name, custom post type, child theme, yes or no, text domain, blah, 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 blah. If we take a look underneath, this is the code that you would then use to actually give you access to all these different features. So as we go through and say, for example, we want to take a look at post type, you could come in and say you want to change any of these kinds of things, or you want to come to the labels and adjust the labels that are going to be used. You can set all the different parameters inside you, including like say options and visibility. So if we say we only want to support title, content and featured image, we can check those, hit update, that will then go through, make any changes that we've just applied and show us then the cleaned up code that's just specific to all the settings that we've just created. Then what we can do is we can simply grab hold of that, put that into our functions PHP file, making sure you do that inside a child theme, not inside your main key theme. Then you're gonna have access to these custom post types, removing the need to use a plugin like CPT UI. So these are great tools. And like I say, you've got a ton of options on here. So this is the first of those two options I want to show you. Next up, we're going to take a look at Hasty. Now, Hasty does pretty much the same kind of thing. You just may prefer one over the other. Again, you've got some free options and you've got some pro options you'd have to pay for. We're only going to take a look at the generators and we're only going to take a look at the free version. So let's go to the generators. Much the same as we had, only in a slightly different visual layout, we've got a range of different options we can put in from. So again, keeping that custom post type as the source of this kind of content. Let's just open this up. And once we've done that, you can see we've got a different layout, but doing the same kind of thing. On the right hand side is all the short code, or all the code that you need to put into your functions PHP file. In the main section, we've got a range of different things we can set up. So the post type name, so we could just say this is vehicles, for example. So you could click inside there, type in vehicles. Once you type that in, you can see it updates on the right hand side in real time. So now vehicles is set inside there and we can do anything we want. The post type name in plural, the post type key, a description, the domain, whether it's hierarchical, exclude it from search, if it's publicly queryable, all those kinds of things. Some of the things inside you are pro, so like the snippet name. To be able to save this snippet so you could come back again, you'd have to have a pro account. But if all you're doing is copying this and then using it inside your functions PHP file, you don't need to save it. You can just copy and paste this into a text file, save it so you've got a copy locally, and then just add that to your functions PHP file. But those are two websites that give you a ton of options that remove the need to be using plugins and still give you the ability to create simple things like custom post types, meta fields, taxonomies, those kinds of good things. So now we've taken a look at all these tools and facilities and downloads and freebies that make the whole process of creating amazing looking websites much easier and considerably less expensive. The final thing we want to do is take a look at some tools that we can, we can check exactly how fast our websites are and then take a look at what might need to be optimized even more to get faster loading websites that just rank better in the search engines. So let's start off taking a look at probably the easiest one to work with, which is Pingdom Speed Test. So it's broken down into two very simple sections, the URL you want to search against and the test location. In other words, where are you testing to the servers? You can click and you can see we've got a range of options. You'd obviously choose the one that's nearest to you. Or if you have a large audience in a certain country that isn't necessarily the same country as where you reside, 
choose that because that's obviously going to give you the closer result to what your typical user is going to see. So I'm going to say this is looking in Europe, UK. So start our test. That's going to go through now, test a great range of different things, and it's going to give us results based upon key factors, page speed, and so on, and give us some suggestions on how we can improve that particular website. So as we can see, we're looking at YouTube. It gives us now some results. Our performance grade, which is a sort of overall grading of how good our site is taking into consideration various different factors like the load time, number of requests, page speeds, and all those kinds of things. As you can see, it tells us the homepage for YouTube is about 3.6 megabytes, which is quite big, but the load time is still pretty respectable, sub two seconds. And if you take a look underneath, there's given us some different things it suggests to improve the results for this particular page. Click to expand, it gives you a little bit more information about what you can do and how you can do it. Also gives you then a breakdown of various different factors. So things like the response code, how heavy certain aspects are like the JavaScript, the images, fonts, HTML, CSS, and so on. So you can use this as a good starting point to find out where any point of your website is a little bit slow or heavy, and then try to optimize it to make sure you can improve that speed time. Next up, we have Another heavy hitter, which is GT Metrics. So this is one of those sites that a lot of people use. It's okay, it does a lot of good things, but it doesn't necessarily give you real world results all the time. It can be a little bit biased. So you do the same kind of thing. You drop in the URL of the site you want to test. You choose the nearest server location to where your target audience is, and then it comes back with results like you can see right now. So as we can see on here, there's quite a di big discrepancy between the Pingdom results and what we're seeing on GT Metrics for exactly the same site using pretty much the same server locations. So again, it gives us information about different things we can do to speed up the site. We've also got a range of different things we can check against. So page speed telling us that defer parsing of JavaScript, serve, serve scale images, leverage browser caching, and so on. Jump to why slow, it gives us a different range of things we can do to improve our site. Most important thing probably though is the waterfall, which is going to show you a waterfall of all the different elements that make up your page. And you can see what takes the longest time and what order they're being loaded in. And again, you can use this as a fault finding way of taking a look at what things are slowing your site or your page down. And then you can address those to get ultimately better results. So like I say, page speed with GT Metrics and with Pingdom, you are seeing a discrepancy there. So I would take the speeds that they give you with a grain of salt, but take more notice of the things like the waterfall charts. Next up, we have page speed insights, which is part of Google itself. Now, this is an important one because this is how your site is potentially going to be ranked inside Google itself. So what this does is it gives you the mobile and the desktop. So again, you can use this to make sure that Google, which is probably more important than what you're seeing with GT Metrics and Pingdom, actually looks at your site and gives you good results. So you want to kind of optimize as best you can for these Google page speeds, because like I say, this is how Google is going to see your site and therefore potentially rank it. Again, you can see it tells us the data, what's slowing things down, things to avoid, any diagnostics we can take a look at. So there's a ton of options there. And again, like I say, these are broken down into both the desktop and the mobile. So you're gonna have slightly different results with each one. So you can cater for each of those different options. Now, out of GT Metrics and Pingdom, there's a better option that I would recommend using. It's not as good looking, but it does give you a more realistic result, which is web page test. So with web page tests, we have a lot more options available. But something to bear in mind is this is also considerably slower to work with. So it may be one of those things, if it's a busy time, you're gonna have to sort of just put all the details in, set everything up, hit the test, then come back a little later. But let's just take a quick look over it and why it has so many other options that I think are gonna be useful to you. As always, you can drop in the URL for the website that you want to test. Then under test locations, you can see we've got a considerable amount of test locations from North America through South America, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and so on. So a ton of options inside there. We can choose between Chrome and Firefox as our browser. Once we open up the advanced settings, we also have a lot more options inside there, including the number of tests that you want to run. So if you're looking to get a mean average across a bunch of tests, you can do it inside here just by simply just setting the number of tests. And then when you run it, it'll continue to do those tests until it's reached the maximum that you set. 
and then you can get an idea or an indication of the values of each one of those test results. You can also choose the connection speed. So if you wanted to see how long it would take on a slower 3G connection, for example, you can open that up and you can choose various different 3G, 4G, 2G, and so on. So different options to choose from to see how fast or how slow it's going to be. So what I would suggest is take a look at web page test, have a look at the different options that are available inside there, because there are a lot. And this should then give you a much more realistic, real world example of how fast your site will be across a range of different devices, different locations, and all those kinds of things. So check out web page test. So there we go, 20 absolutely free online resources to help you get more from your web design projects. Are they websites you've seen before, something that's new to you, or have you found alternatives you just think are better, offer more, whatever, doesn't really matter. Drop a comment in the comment section below, add some links in there, let us all know what you found online you think are invaluable resources for yourself, and share those with everybody. As always, all of the applicable links are in the description below. My name is Paul C. This has been WP Tuts, and until next time, take care.